Thanks so much, Robin, for the introduction. So I'll be speaking about confounding covariates and causal inference in nutrition based on a uh, paper that we published last year. Um, and I'm just trying to see how to advance the slide. There we go. Um, based on a paper that we published last year. And I'll start by providing a bit of a uh, brief overview of the motivation for this study. So in October of last year, we published a guideline in Annals of Internal Medicine addressing red and processed meat consumption. And this guideline received quite a bit of attention, not all entirely positive. In brief, the guideline recommended for individuals to continue their current levels of red and processed meat consumption on account that one, the evidence supporting a causal link between red and processed meat and adverse health outcomes is low to very low certainty according to grade criteria. And two, the magnitude of effect of red and processed meat, if indeed red and processed meat are harmful, is negligible. And most individuals, given their values and preferences, would actually choose to continue consuming red and processed meat. Now, for those of you that are familiar with grade criteria and nutrition evidence in general, these recommendations aren't really that surprising. So much of the evidence in nutrition comes from large non-randomized studies called nutritional epidemiology studies. And these studies and other non-randomized studies are typically or typically provide only lower, very low certainty evidence to support causal relationships due to concerns with confounding bias, whereby there's a distortion of the effect of the exposure of interest on the outcome due to its association with other factors that also influence the outcome. Now, the risk of bias from known confounders can be mitigated through design considerations like restricting the study eligibility criteria to one or more levels of the confounding factors or by matching participants, as well as through statistical considerations like including confounding factors as covariates in analytic models. However, the results from such studies can be highly susceptible to the specific confounders that are adjusted for in analytic models. A study published in 2015 used data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey to actually illustrate this. So each graph here shows the results for the association between a particular exposure and all-cause mortality. Each point on the graph represents results from one analysis, and each analysis includes a different number and combination of covariates. The x-axis is the effect size and the y-axis is the p-value. This study showed that inferences from non-randomized studies are highly contingent on model specification, specifically the choice of covariates that are included in analytic models. As you can see on the plot on the lower right, the choice of covariates can even completely reverse the direction of effect. And they called this phenomenon the vibration of effects. So what does this mean? Well, it means that in order to draw reasonable inferences from non-randomized studies, methods for the selection of an adjustment for covariates should be highly credible. And in our study, we investigated exactly this. We looked at the reporting and credibility of methods for the selection of covariates in a sample of nutritional epidemiology studies. We also assessed the consistency in choice of covariates among studies reporting on the same outcome and similar types of exposures. And we also assessed how authors interpreted their findings given the potential for residual confounding. To do this, we selected a random sample of 150 nutritional epidemiology studies from the top five high impact general medicine and nutrition journals. Studies were eligible for inclusion if they were observational in design and reported on the association between one or more nutritional exposures and patient important health outcomes using generalized linear models. Teams of two-year reviewers working independently and in duplicates screened the search results and extracted data from the included studies. And I'll provide a very brief description of our sample of studies. So most of the studies that we looked at were cohort or cross-sectional studies. The median number of participants included in these studies was slightly over 8,000. So these are really large epidemiologic studies. 
Most studies reported on the health effects of dietary patterns with a relatively equal proportion also reporting on foods, food groups, and micro and macronutrients. So what did we find? We actually collected a decent amount of what I found to be pretty interesting data, but because of time limitations, I'm really going to zero in on our key findings. We found that the majority of studies don't report selecting covariates a priori. Why is this a problem? Well, unlike clinical trials that commonly operate under strict standards at every step of data analysis, including the preparation of detailed data analysis plans before the review of data by investigators, when authors conduct analyses of observational studies, they typically have a great deal of discretion over data analysis methods, including model building procedures and choice of covariates. As we saw with the vibration of effect study, the results of observational studies are highly contingent on choice of covariates. So by including covariates that inflate the effect estimate and excluding covariates that deflate the effect estimate, an analyst's model building decisions and procedures may be heavily influenced by the possibility of obtaining statistically significant or interesting or publishable results. We found that two thirds of studies didn't report the criteria or methods for selecting covariates, despite the stroke checklist, which most of these studies claim to be following, including a statement on reporting on reporting which confounders were adjusted for and why they were included. Among the minority of studies that did report how covariates were selected, most reported selecting known or suspected risk factors of the outcome as covariates. A smaller proportion of studies reported selecting factors suspected to be associated with the exposure, factors associated with both the exposure and the outcome, or factors associated with either the exposure or the outcome. A very small minority of studies reported using directed acyclic graphs or causal diagrams to select confounders. Now, some of the most common criteria for the selection of covariates are highly misguided, including all factors suspected to be associated with the outcome as covariate may lead to more covariates than needed to adequately adjust for confounding. Within even the largest of studies, including too many covariates can lead to the breakdown of conventional fitting methods like maximum likelihood and produce data sparsity in which there are too few subjects at crucial combinations of the covariates with consequent inflation of effect estimates. For example, consider including all predictors of the outcome, all cause mortality in an analytic model. Even in very large studies, um, adjusting for all predictors of all-cause mortality is really not feasible. Selecting factors that are highly predictive of the exposure can produce multicollinearity and hence unnecessarily wide confidence intervals and potentially inflated effect estimates. For example, adjustment for instrumental variables, variables that are predictive of the exposure but have no causal association with the outcome has been shown to decrease precision and increase bias in certain scenarios. Despite widespread endorsement in the literature, very few studies reported using causal diagrams to select confounders. Causal diagrams represent an analyst's best understanding of the causal structure underlying the research question, and it can be used to identify confounders for inclusion in the model while also ensuring that unnecessary variables or variables whose inclusion in the model may actually bias the results are excluded. For example, causal diagrams can be used to identify colliders, variables whose inclusion in the model biases the results. In case you're not familiar, colliders are variables with two or more antecedent causes that lie within the pathway between the exposure and the outcome that are often confused with confounders, but adjustment for which actually biases the results. And I'll use a COVID-19 related example to illustrate this. So a few weeks ago, a preprint of a review showed that there are very few patients that are hospitalized with COVID that are smokers. 
Now, there have been many proposed hypotheses to sort of explain this counterintuitive relationship between smoking and COVID severity. And one of these hypotheses involves collider bias. Take, for example, this very simplified causal diagram. We know that in many countries, due to limited testing capacity, frontline healthcare workers and those with severe symptoms are more likely to be tested. We also know that frontline healthcare workers are maybe at increased risk for severe COVID due to repeated exposure to higher viral loads. Finally, we know that healthcare workers are less likely to be smokers. So by conditioning on COVID testing, a collider in this scenario, uh, we can induce a negative correlation between smoking and COVID severity if indeed smoking is a risk factor for severe COVID. How does that work? Well, a substantial proportion of patients with severe COVID are likely to be healthcare workers who are less likely than the general population to be smokers. By conditioning on, um, on COVID testing, we can actually induce a negative correlation between smoking and severe COVID. Of course, this is all hypothetical for now. We also investigated whether studies used any data-driven methods to select covariates, and we found that more than a quarter of studies did use data-driven methods, common examples of which included the change in estimate criterion, screening covariates based on p-values, or stepwise regression procedures. Studies that use the change in estimate criterion included covariates in the final analytic model if their inclusion in the model changed the effect estimate of the exposure of interest by an appreciable amount, typically 5 or 10 percent. Studies that screened covariates based on p-values included covariates in the analytic model if their p-values are sufficiently low, typically 0 0.05 or 0.1. And stepwise regression procedures included things like backward um, elimination or forward regression. Now, data-driven methods for covariate selection are typically only helpful in a very narrow range of scenarios, and they can frequently lead to the selection of suboptimal models. Screening covariates based on p-values and stepwise regression procedures may achieve a parsimonious model, but it may also select weaker confounders over stronger confounders if weaker confounders are more strongly correlated with the exposure or the outcome. For example, consider a variable that is strongly predictive of the outcome but completely independent of the exposure. This variable will be selected over a confounder that is only moderately correlated with both the exposure and the outcome, even though the latter variable is a confounder and the former variable is not. All data-driven methods also produce p-values that are too small because they ignore preliminary testing on the data. These methods also ignore any theoretical and empirical understanding of important confounders. They treat colliders and confounders equally, and they rely heavily on the available data in which causal relationships may or may not be evident. For outcomes for which we included more than 10 studies, we also assessed consistency in the choice of covariates among the studies. So these matrices present covariates included in models and studies reporting on all-cause mortality and diabetes. Across the columns, we have these studies grouped according to the types of exposures that they reported on, and across the um, rows are the covariates. Shaded cells in green represent adjustment or matching for that covariate, and covariates for which adjustment was not applicable in a particular study are shaded in gray. And I know this is impossible to see, but the point is just to show the remarkable inconsistency and in choice of covariates across the studies. We found 20 studies that reported on all-cause mortality, and they included 72 unique covariates, but the median number of studies that adjusted for each covariate was just one. We included 13 studies that reported on diabetes, and these studies included 62 unique covariates. And again, the median number of studies that adjusted for each covariate was just one. And this brings us to the question, given the substantial inconsistency in choice of covariates we're seeing, is there adequate control for confounding in any of these studies? And the answer to that is probably not. 
Finally, we investigated how authors interpreted their results given the potential for residual confounding. We found that a third of studies didn't acknowledge the potential for residual confounding in their discussion. Over a third of studies also didn't discuss the likelihood of confounding bias. And overall, these results suggest a low level of appreciation for confounding. Why is this a problem? Well, non-randomized studies, particularly nutritional epidemiology studies, are too often misconstrued by readers and sensationalized by the media. More conspicuous consideration of residual confounding bias in reports may lead to more cautious interpretation of these findings by readers. So what did we learn from this study? Well, we know that appropriately dealing with confounding bias is essential to being able to draw valid inferences from non-randomized studies. We also know that the improper omission and indiscriminate inclusion of covariates in statistical models can lead to compromised inferences. Selecting important confounders as covariates and minimizing their impact through appropriate design and statistical considerations and then acknowledging any remaining uncertainty due to potential residual confounding is an integral component of inference making in epidemiology. Unfortunately, we found that studies often use suboptimal methods to select covariates for adjustment in analytic models. We encourage authors, peer reviewers, research funders, journal editors, and even Cochrane review authors that are reading these studies and incorporating their results and evidence syntheses to overall be more mindful of these issues. Thank you for your attention.